This is Point of Inquiry for Friday, August 18th, 2006. Welcome to Point of Inquiry. I'm DJ Grothy. Point of Inquiry is the radio show and podcast of the Center for Inquiry, a think tank collaborating with the State University of New York at Buffalo on the new Science and the Public Master's degree. CFI also has branches in Manhattan, Tampa, Hollywood, and now Washington, D.C., in addition to 11 other cities around the world. Let me tell you about Center for Inquiry before we get into the meat of today's episode. Center for Inquiry is headquarters to a number of organizations of public education and advocacy all working together to advance science and reason in our society. Yet each has its own distinct mission. Some of these organizations include PSYCOP, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, the Council for Secular Humanism, North America's leading organization for ethical non-religious people, the Commission for Scientific Medicine, and on and on. I'm pleased that on today's point of inquiry, we'll be joined by one of America's scientific superstars, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. We'll be talking about why science is so important to society, about science education for young people, about intelligent design, about some breaking news this week in astronomy, and a whole host of other subjects. We're planning on going a little long just so we can pack it all in. But first, a magazine simply titled The Universe. Among his seven books is his memoir, The Sky is Not the Limit, Adventures of an Urban Astrophysicist, and also Origins, 14 Billion Years of Cosmic Evolution, co-written with Donald Goldsmith. Origins is the companion book to the PBS series of the same name, in which Dr. Tyson serves as the on-camera host. Beginning later this fall, he's going to appear as the on-camera host of PBS Nova's program, Science Now, which will explore the frontiers of all the science that shapes our understanding of our place in the cosmos. Dr. Tyson is the recipient of seven honorary doctorates and the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal. His contributions to the public appreciation of the cosmos have been recognized by the International Astronomical Union in their official naming of asteroid 13123 Tyson. On a lighter note, a few years ago, he was voted Sexiest Astrophysicist Alive by People Magazine. He's the first occupant of the Frederick P. Rose Directorship of the Hayden Planetarium in Manhattan, where he also teaches. He joins us on Point of Inquiry this afternoon from his home in Manhattan. Neil deGrasse Tyson, welcome to Point of Inquiry. DJ, it is a pleasure to be on Point of Inquiry, one of my favorite podcasts. Wow. Well, thanks again for being on the show, Dr. Tyson. Let's begin by talking about the big news this week. The International Astronomical Union is proposing a redefining of what a planet is, which would let Pluto-sized worlds be included in the definition. Is this because a new planet was discovered, or is this just a new way of looking at what a planet is, and it's uh, beginning to catch on? There's a lot of pomp and circumstance surrounding that announcement, and the public deserves to sort of understand how that all came about. It's not even a long story. It's a very simple story. For the longest while, we just knew there were these objects in the solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and you go on out to Neptune. And then in 1930, this other object was discovered beyond Neptune. Everyone was excited. By the way, an American discovered that object, and it was named Pluto. And back then, they just assumed it was at least as big as Earth, possibly as big as Neptune. And then over time, they realized, well, it's actually not that big, as better data became available they found that Pluto was actually quite small. And not only was it small, it had a whole other kind of composition compared with the rest of the known planets. It was mostly ice by volume, and no other planet had that composition. And so what do you do with an object like that? Do you sort of bring it in and say, all right, we don't know what else to do with you, but we'll you know, keep you in the back, just you know, stay quiet. <laughs> and so that what became the ninth planet. When you want to think about the solar system, no educator with integrity is going to value the simple memorization of planets in order from the sun. 
what you want to do is find out what properties objects have in common and what properties are different. And then you can compare and contrast, and in that way you can glean insight into what makes the solar system work. And when you do that exercise, Pluto doesn't fit in with any way you would gather and group and organize the rest of the planets of the solar system. So Pluto is not actually a planet, but it was considered one. It was considered a planet because we had no other way to think about it. You, you couldn't create a new category for it because you can't have a category of one. It was not until the 1990s where, in Hawaii, using some of the best telescopes in the world, Dave Jewett and Jane Liu discovered another icy small object orbiting beyond Neptune orbiting in the region of the solar system where you find Pluto. And then you say, hmm, I wonder, wonder what's going on. They looked some more. They found more objects, and more, and more, and more. And so now the tally is in the high hundreds, and it'll easily pass the thousands as the data get better and better. So these are more objects pretty much exactly like Pluto. Exactly. Exactly. And in fact, this is a swath of real estate that had been predicted to be there and populated by just such objects Uh, It was predicted in the mid-20th century by Gerard Kuiper, who was a well-known planetary theorist. And so there they are. And so all of a sudden you get to say, hey, Pluto has family. Pluto is part of another kind of species of object in the solar system. That's why it was such an oddball. And so beginning in the 1990s, there was this movement to possibly reclassify objects in the solar system, grouping them perhaps among like properties as you would create any classification scheme. Now, here's the problem. The word planet has not been defined. There's, you're telling me there's not a consensus definition of the word planet in astronomy? There hasn't been. The last time the word planet was defined was 2,500 years ago. And when the Greeks, the ancient <laughs> Greeks, looked up and they saw some objects that moved against the background stars, and if you were a wanderer, that's what they called them, Wandering Greek is planetis, planets. So that's where we get the word from. And there were seven wanderers, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the sun, and the moon. And we trace the names of our days of the week through Norse and Roman legends, gods, that trace back to the names of those planets. So that's what it was. And then Copernicus says, wait a minute, the sun is in the middle, the moon goes around us, and we go around the sun. And at that point... That very clean definition of planet, which was just simply wanderer, no longer applied because we were of commensurate rank to Mercury, Venus, and Mars. So you couldn't call them a planet and we not. So we called us a planet. And then the moon went around us, so that's not a planet. And so people just sort of by gentleman's agreement said if it's big and it goes around the sun, it's a planet. It was not ever formally defined. And in recent times, you have Pluto lovers out there who would massage the definition of planet in such a way that would include Pluto. And then you have the people who are trying to, like, reorganize the teaching of the solar system. And, by the way, we were among those here at the American Museum of Natural History to step away from the simple enumeration of planets and group like objects together. And so when we opened our new facility, there were enough of these new icy bodies orbiting beyond Neptune for us to gather them together and create a family of objects. And so we took Pluto, separated it from the rest of the known planets, and grouped it together with what is now known as the Kuiper Belt of Comets. And by the way, I think Pluto was happier there because it was one of the largest of the Kuiper Belt Comets, whereas among the rest of the objects, it was surely the puniest planet. And this was our posture back in 2000. By the way, we split the rest of the planets as well. We took the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, grouped them together, just simply as the gas giants. And then we took the small rocky ones, Earth included, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and grouped them together. Then we had the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt and the sun, and we present the family photo of the solar system. And it's not the enumeration of counted objects. It is the gathering of properties that objects have in common. It sounds like you think that the International Astronomical Union's notion to redefine the word planet to include Pluto-sized objects in our solar system, well, it sounds like you think that it is a bad idea. Well, I applaud the IAU's efforts 
to come up with an unambiguous definition for planet. The only reason why fights broke out over planet 